Okay, thank you very, very much. It's been a wonderful, wonderful day um, of research and making new friends and coming to a new place. And uh, my husband, who's here with me, we, we both thank you all very, very much. Um, I'm going to talk about progeria and the Progeria Research Foundation <clears throat> and tell a bit of a story. <clears throat> uh, first, of course, disclosures. Um, because I'm going to talk about certain things. Uh, mostly, I want you to know that I uh, receive in-kind donations. That is, the clinical trials that I'm going to talk about uh, that are very exciting are happening with the uh, donation of medicines from Merck and Novartis. I'm also uh, a volunteer medical director for the Progeria Research Foundation. And I am uh, funded, uh, the programs that I'm going to talk about are funded by PRF, the Progeria Research Foundation, and the National Institutes of Health. I want to start out by telling you that there's somebody very special here, in fact a family, Sammy Basso, his mom, Laura, and his dad. That family is very courageous, um, very supportive in many ways of what we're doing, what the world is doing to help children with progeria. Their uh, association has supported a lot of the research uh, and, and driven a lot of what I'm going to tell you about today. So um, there, is an, there is no end to how much appreciation I feel and also others for what they've done over the years. It's been a tremendous thing. But you'll hear a lot about that later on from Sammy. So you know, I, I, I want to talk first about rare diseases. Um, progeria is so incredibly rare. It's incidence, which means how many children are born with it, uh, one in uh, eight million b live births, and its prevalence, the number of people who have progeria in the world, is one in 20 million people. So that adds up to about 18 cases right now, children with progeria in the United States, about 17 or 18 in all of Europe. So why should we study it? Why should we look at rare diseases? Well, I'm going to tell you, should we? Yes. We definitely, definitely should for a lots of different reasons. So first of all, yes, progeria can tell us about aging in some ways, and aging can tell us about progeria in some ways, and that's very important. Um, but to me, that's not the, the biggest priority. In, in this world, there are five to 7,000 distinct rare diseases. That makes up 6 to 8% of the population, most of them actually pediatric. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot of children affected by rare diseases. And that means that whatever you do in your research and we, what we do in the clinic and recognizing progeria throughout the world and other rare diseases, that can really help a person, really help a child and their family to live better and longer lives. So what I'm going to tell you about today is focusing on progeria. I'm going to present to you the disease phenotype, tell you about the disease itself, um, talk a little bit about the biologic and genetic basis for disease, um, but mostly I'm going to spend time talking about the programs that we've built and the story of the programs that we've built over time, over the last 18 years that have sort of pushed, catapulted this field forward. Um, and talk a little bit about generalized aging and what we can learn from that and apply to progeria and vice versa. This is progeria. This is a, a little girl with progeria you see over time. This is a seg what's called a segmental premature aging syndrome. That means there, there are some things that overlap with aging and some things that don't overlap, and it's our job to figure out what those things are and how we can learn from them. This is an autosomal dominant disease, sporadic, meaning it's not passed down within families, it just happens. It's a multi-system disease, and that's, that's um, very, very um, important. It affects um, lots of different systems that I'll go through in a slide in a couple of minutes. It affects um, growth and um, body fat and joints, and the skeleton, and the auditory system, and the dental system, but most of all it affects the cardiovascular system, that's what we care about most. But there are some things that are not affected by progeria, um, and that's important to study as well, because we have to understand why that is. 
Children have normal liver function and kidney function and gastrointestinal function, a normal immune system. These are some of the things, actually, that allow us to conduct safely, more safely, clinical trials with medicines that are um, processed through the liver or the kidney. So we're, in some ways, we're quite fortunate that there are some things about progeria that are normal. One of the first things we see in progeria um, is uh, uh, um, that children are born with a normal size, but then they start to fail to, str to thrive. They start to grow more slowly and drop off the growth curve, usually in their first year, but definitely by the middle of their second year. And you can see this is a growth curve. This is two years of age. This child was born in, an, in the normal weight curve, but dropped off, and they drop off, and they never recover, and their line, each individual child has a linear growth line, and that helped us a lot, actually, to conduct clinical trials, because they know, we know natural. As I said before, there are effects on the hair. They, they, they lose all of their hair, so total alopecia, lots of um, a, total, a global lipodystrophy, no body fat, skin signs, Joints, some of the joints are contracted. This, this tells us about their collagen, that they have problems with extracellular matrix. Um, they have bony problems as well, and nail dystrophy. And the most important thing for us is the cardiovascular disease. Here you see a child, at, at an MRI of the carotid arteries of a five-year-old, and here we have a normal uh, right-sided carotid a clean, nice flow you see here through the, this side, and then over on the other side, there's a complete blockage. And this is what we have to combat. This leads to, this is global, progressive, leads to heart attacks and strokes, and um, children are, uh, pass away six years if they don't get clinical trial treatment, and we'll talk about that. So in 1998, um, my husband and I ha had a child named Sam, and at the age of two, he was diagnosed with progeria. And of course, we're both physicians, so we sort of dropped everything, as any parent would, and said, what's going on here? What we discovered is that there was nobody working in this field. This is, the, this is the probably a typical rare disease story for the uh, 1990s and, and, and before that. There was nobody. A couple of scientists doing a little something, no research funding, no place for parents. No place to get genetic materials to study this disease, even if you wanted to. Uh, no funding at all um, from the National Institutes of Health had ever happened. And so we um, started the Progeria Research Foundation. Um, this is my husband, Scott, who's here today, and our son, Sam. We started that in 1998. Of course, the mission was to find the cause of treatment. I'm going to tell you about is the journey um, that tells us we're somewhere in the middle, but more importantly, that there's something that all of you can do about this. My real goal today is to have every single person in this audience search. You can, and you'll be supported um, if you choose to do that. So, this is the status right now of some of the programs um, um, that are. That are created by the Progeria Research Foundation. There is now an international patient registry with 233 children, a cell and tissue bank that's held at one of the hospitals I work at in Rhode Island. Um, we've got over 800 lines of cells uh, and samples and have distributed those to um, many, many countries. So this is a very international effort and everybody should feel like they can be supported. There's a medical and research database that is a collection of um, medical records from children with progeria that, are, that we analyze and ask questions about clinical care. Um, and we've created a handbook from that that I'll show you the cover of. We hold scientific meetings, international scientific meetings every other year. And of course, support research funding. But this is where we started. This is where we could start, because at the beginning, we didn't even really know if this was genetic a genetic disease, and we certainly didn't know um, a lot about where to go with the science. So we started by asking, OK, we have to find the patients. If you can't find them, then you can't help them. We make first contact. 
We get them involved in the international progeria registry, and that's how we communicate and keep contact over time and tell them when there's a trend going on and what the science is all about. Started the cell and tissue bank and that medical research database. We sort of started from scratch, and what I'm going to show you over time is how this, these programs grew. What we also did was put together a team and reach out uh, and, and put together a team of scientists that were looking for the gene mutation responsible for progeria. And in 2003, that happened. So almost simultaneously, teams from the National Institute of Health were led by Francis Collins and a team in France led by Nicholas Lowy published in Nature and Science the gene mutation responsible for progeria. And I'm telling you, we were just catapulted into a completely new phase of capability for pushing the field forward. And we discovered that laminae, a protein that was known to the scientific world, is responsible for progeria, mutations in that. And this is basically what laminae is. Laminae is a protein that binds the inner nuclear membrane. It's also found in the nucleoplasm. It binds chromatin and it has it affects transcription of hundreds of downstream uh, proteins. It has both structural effects on the cell nucleus and signaling effects. And it, it's expressed mostly by differentiated cell types. So you can see how, if it's expressed by differentiated cell types, you can see how um, children with progeria are born looking pretty normal. So they wouldn't um, have a problem too much as a fetus. Now we start to understand this disease even just a little bit. Then we move on to the gene mutation, and the gene mutation actually tells us an awful lot about the link between aging and progeria. And what I'll show you just here is I'm just going to focus on the fact that this is a single base pair mutation. So one base change, and you've got progeria. Okay, so here's a child with progeria, here's, the, here's, here's you and me, we have a C, a cytosine, and here's a person with progeria, they have a T, and that's it. <laughs> And now you can start to understand why aging and progeria have something in common. Because this T makes it easy for us to make something called progerin, which is a shortened and abnormal laminate protein. However, the rest of us sometimes make it because there isn't too much of a difference between this and this. And so the spliceosome likes this a lot, this sequence, but also likes the sequence in all of us a little bit. And that means about one one hundredth of the time, we make progerin too. So we finally have something to grasp, something biological that says, hey, I can understand why there might be some overlap, and we can explore that. Now, what can we do with that? We can study the link to aging a little bit more. And what I'm showing you here in green is what I showed you before. What I'm going to show you in red and go through a little bit are all the programs that we could start once we knew the gene mutation, the protein, lamin A, and how progerin is involved in disease in creating progeria. OK, so we know that aging is multifactorial. We want to single out different factors in this. We know that children with progeria have normal cholesterol levels and they don't smoke for sure. So now we're looking at progerin and asking, is there a link? And so what I'm just going to show you here is, I hope you can see this because I know there's some light in here, but the darker it gets, the more spots you see here. There's, this, is a, this is a forehead biopsy of a 93-year-old showing all of these cells lighting up with progerin. And you see none of this in a baby. So that's the skin. This is the vasculature. These graphs show different layers of a blood vessel, the media, the adventitia, and a plaque. Here is age. And as we age, there's about a 3% annual increase in the amount of progerin found in your vasculature. That's you and me. So it's not a cause and effect, but it's a pretty good start at, hey, we really do have something in common. When we study atherosclerosis, we should think about studying progeria and what these kids can tell us. And perhaps some of the treatments for progeria can help the aging, and perhaps vice versa. Some of the treatments for aging can help children with progeria. What could we do next? Well, we had a diagnostics program. When you have a diagnostics program, you could definitively define mutationally um, 
you can have a, a, a for, you know, discover children and not get misdiagnoses. And so when you run a clinical trial, you know what you're doing. So that's a good thing. We could conduct progeria research that shows us mouse, that we can now create progeria mouse models, real mouse models with the right mutation. And so we know when we're studying something, we're studying it in at least a, an animal model of progeria. And that's been intensely helpful for things that we want to try out, perhaps in clinical trials, for testing those in cells and also in animal models. So, for each of these programs, we've been fairly successful, I would say, because now we know of worldwide today 107 children with progeria. We know that there are about 350 kids. Half of those are in India and China, very hard to reach. But we are in touch with almost a third of the children. Um, that if you exclude India and China, which you never would want to, but most of the children around the world with progeria their families we're in touch with, and we've been able to diagnose definitively. And that's very, very important for the cell and tissue bank, getting samples, and also for trials, and for just informing them and their doctors about how to best care for a child with progeria. This is lamina. This is the post-translational processing. The reason I'm telling you about this is because the three clinical trials that we have run for progeria at Boston Children's Hospital are all pathway-based. They're based on, on an understanding of the post-translational processing of lamin A. So what we show here is on, the, on the, uh, your left, we show, I'm showing you lamin A processing, and on the right is progerin processing. And essentially what you want to know is that there's a farnesylation step first. So progerin is translated first as a pre, there's a pre-lamin A here. Progerin has 50 amino acids missing. So it sort of mimics lamin A in a very bad way because it acts like lamin A. It attaches onto its binding partners, and that's how it disrupts a lot of cell function, by mimicking lamin A but being an abnormal protein. So you have a farnesylation step here, and a farnesylation step means that a farnesyl group attaches onto the protein and allows it, it's lipophilic, it allows it to insert, intercalate into the inner nuclear membrane, and that's how we're going to go at our first treatment for progeria. The difference is where normal prelamin A, that at, at, in its processing, chops off this farnesyl group, progerin cannot, because it's missing the site of attachment for the enzyme that does that. Then there's a carboxymethylation step, and a maturation step at the end, again, that takes off this last piece and the farnesyl group, but not in progerin. So progerin stays, unlike lamin A, it doesn't bounce off the nuclear membrane. It stays, and it's toxic, and it builds up. OK, so we move on to strategies for treatment trials. We started a weighing-in program at home where um, children are weighed over time, so we know what their weight, rate of weight gain is, and so we know when they come in for the trials if the drug over time is going to affect that. We did natural history studies and created a handbook for progeria um, and clinical trials. Here is the, the handbook, the first um, hundred page, it's about a hundred page handbook for physicians and families at home to say, hey, this is how you care for progeria. We've no, we know you've never seen it before. Here's the best way to go about things. And we've conducted clinical trials. And I'm going to go through each one of these. But essentially, I want to show you that these are international trials. Children have come in because we can reach them, because we know of them. We, we've diagnosed them mutationally. The first trial from 17 countries, then 24, and then 29 countries. So we're reaching a lot of kids and a lot of families. We, we definitely need to reach more. We're always doing outreach, but this is essentially what's been happening. Everybody comes into the hospital. OK, so the first treatment strategy we're going to use is what I told you, Farnesyl, uh, called a Farnesyl transferase inhibitor. And it interrupts the progress of progerin post-translational processing by inhibiting the farnesyl group from attaching onto preprogerin. So we figure if you can't attach, and you can't get into the cell wall, and you can't do uh, the, the inner nuclear membrane, and you can't do as much damage. That was the hypothesis. 
some nice, elegant preclinical data in vitro and in the brand new progeria mouse models supported this. And we started a trial. And the children came in in pairs. The, the title here is we're much better um, together than we are on our own. And that is true for these kids and these families and everybody else, including us. We have to collaborate. The only way to succeed is to collaborate with each other, with drug companies, with families. Everybody has to work together. If one piece falls apart, we're not going to get anywhere. And that's what our big effort is. So they've come in, and they go through a battery of testing at Boston Children's Hospital for about a week, and then go home with drug. And that, that battery of testing was head to toe. And this is what we found. We found that lonifarnib, the farnesyl transferase inhibitor, improves rate of weight gain, bone structure, neurological hearing, but most importantly, it has effects on the cardiovascular system that I'm going to show you in a minute. It doesn't touch other things. It doesn't touch um, the bone, the fat, the joints, the hair, and the dental problems. So this is a first step, but honestly, we didn't even know we could get anything. We didn't know if we could improve anything in progeria before this first trial was done. So it tells us something important, and that is, yes, we can get someplace. We can do something good for these kids. And that we didn't know before. So this is just one of the cardiovascular improvements I think you should know about. It's really important. Um, what we're measuring here is called carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. And it's essentially the stiffness of a vessel. So if a vessel is very stiff, it's going to take um, it has to, there has to be faster flow of blood from the, from the neck down to the thigh, and that means you're going to very ha have a high flow rate. And here you're seeing big numbers. Each one of these dot circles is one child. These are big, big numbers. This is the normal range. And after two years of treatment, each one of these children, except for one, decreased their pulse wave velocity. Now, you and I have a pulse wave velocity that creeps up over time because everything gets stiffer in us, right? Our joints, you know, so do our blood vessels. And so these children start out with the pulse wave velocity of about a 40 to 50 to 60 year old. And they're ending up a lot better. And that correlates, at least in the elderly, with decreased rate of heart, heart attacks and decreased death. So this was very promising data for us. We also looked at lifespan. I know it was only a two-year trial, but this is actually recent data. We took all of the children we could find in the world, 204 of them, over history, and we were able to create, through that database program and the registry, what's called a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Here you have survival probability, so everybody's living here and nobody's living here. This is without treatment. We created this curve that tells you, on average, what's happening with survival, and we wanted to see if we could influence it, if we could move it. And the, and the answer is yes. With lonifarnib therapy, what you're seeing here in blue are children that aren't treated, and in red are the ch children that are treated, and you're seeing an improvement in survival over time. Now, this is just two years, but this was very statistically significant. So we were able to bump this just a little bit, which means we should be able to bump it a lot if we find better treatments in the future. Then we conducted the second trial. We took the lonifarnib and we kept it, and we added in statins and bisphosphonates. And they work on the farnesylation as well, but they work a little bit more upstream. They're, they're not farnesyl transferase inhibitors, but they're, they're farnesylation inhibitors. And we hoped that this would boost the effect of lonifarnib. And essentially what we find, found was, at least clinically, we could not detect a boosting of the lonifarnib effect using these two drugs. So we, we're not using them anymore. But what it did allow us to do was treat a lot longer. So now we have five and a half years of lonifarnib treatment, and we can ask the same question, are we still helping these kids to survive longer? And the answer is yes. Here, again, is a longer, here's time since start of, start of treatment. Now we're up to some, some of the children six and a half years. Here's the untreated curve, and here's the treated curve. So you see five 
um, deaths in the, un, in the treated group versus 21. So we're budging it. We're doing a little bit of something here with the lonifarnib. What are we doing today? So that was trial number two. This is trial number three going on again at Boston Children's Hospital. Children flying in from all over the world. We are trying something different um, to add on to the lonifarnib again called everolimus, which is a rapamycin derivative. And it gets at the progerin by increasing autophagy, increasing essentially the recycling or getting, taking out the trash, getting rid of the protein a little bit better. And it works great in vitro, and we hope it works in the children as well. So that's where we are. We are what's at what's called a phase one portion of a phase one, two trial of everolimus plus lonifarnib to treat children with progeria. Um, it should be happening over the next, it's about uh, six, seven months old, and uh, we'll be conducting it hopefully over the next two and a half years. We are somewhere in the middle, as you can tell. We just need to forge ahead um, with incre increasing ever efforts, and you can be part of that. I hope you all want to be, because you'll be very supported, um, because we're far from finished. But I do want to tell you something else. We, um, as I said, support um, and hold international meetings of scientists from all over the world. And the most recent one was just a few months ago, 180 scientists, progeria scientists. There used to remember be like two. Now there are 180. They gathered in Boston from 14 different countries. And what you're seeing here is a list of about 18 different potential treatments that have at least in vitro and some animal model data to support them. So pushing forward with all of these at once to see which sort of ferret out um, and which should be tried in clinical trials is very important. So this is how we get, get, get to uh, move ahead together with determination, with hard work, with courage, because families and children have more courage than I could even imagine. They're unbelievable people. And I want to thank the whole Basso family, of course. And I do want to show you this awesome picture of um, Sam and Sammy drinking it up about five years ago, having a grand old time. And I, I think this is really what it's all about. So thank you, Katerina, for inviting me. And thank you, Sammy. because I have this thing attached to me. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Thank you very much. That was really, really interesting. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, is it known why the brain is unaffected? Because, of course, if we understand that, so, so since the mutation is ubiquitary, yeah. so these, uh, the brain cells must have something that protects yeah. them from the, you know, the deleterious yeah. effects uh, of... Uh, also, it may not only relate it to maturation and differentiation of cells uh, because uh, many neurons are already specificated when uh, children are born. So, yeah. then I have Okay. Okay, great question. Oh, the crest, okay. The question is, um, why is the brain unaffected? Did I tell you these kids are brilliant? I should tell you these kids are really amazing. Their personalities, I mean, they can get strokes. That's the vascular disease. But otherwise, they're just totally great personalities and age appropriate, if not beyond, um, in their education. Um, I can give you two potential answers. One is, we, yes, progerin is produced in the brain. However, um, we're talking about, um, yes, and yes, we're talking about differentiated cells. Recently, about a year ago, there was a paper about microRNA and how that suppresses progerin production in the brain, and that may be part of it. But remember, there are some organs, like the kidney and the liver, that also produce progerin that have some reserve and so aren't really clinically affected. So there could be a couple of different reasons, but one of them was pretty fascinating to me, this microRNA suppressing their transcription. What was your other question? Uh, are you 
also read that, you know, this paper on uh, telomerase. Yeah. And I wonder whether, of course, you know, this is, uh, you know, for more futuristic uh, therapies, uh, but it's an interesting aspect, you know, because yeah. it was published that uh, if you transfect the telomerase uh, in somatic cells, uh, you can uh, um, delay the efforts of... Uh, Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. Okay. So I had a I have a couple of telomerase slides. <laughs> um, so thank you for asking that question. So this is another potential overlap with you know the study of aging. So essentially, um, a lot of the good studies have come from um, Can Cow's lab uh, when she was uh, at at the National Institutes of Health and now at the University of Maryland. Um, progressive telomere damage during senescence plays a causative role in progerin production. So what you see here is it sort of goes both ways. If you immortalize cells, you suppress progerin production. So some evidence linking the telomere structure with progerin and conversely, in cells with uncapped telomeres, you get an increase in progerin production. So yes, they are linked. I think a lot more needs to be done with that, but yes, they are linked. And the question is, could we find treatment somewhere in the telomere realm for progeria? I'd like to see that. Good. Okay, thank you. We all want to see Sammy now.